So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its Volcanic Explosivity Index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, That's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. 
For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal, as how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. 
Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, 
these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hotspot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly a thousand feet beneath the surface 
with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Leskentire Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day, making it way more dramatic in monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes Al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the salt water. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. 
Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world. The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it. Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So, staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now? Find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with mm. everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano, as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. 
You remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear! And there goes a rhino! Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species. They all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. You think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels, and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't bud. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. 
Airplanes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open, far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet. It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, at 8.45 p.m. About 20 miles southwest of the capital, molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories – active, dormant, or extinct. Around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive, and this all happened 6 miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close. While other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption. And those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March, and geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top 5 most dangerous volcanoes in the US, so geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then, but this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. 
Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. The eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon, a dirty thunderstorm. That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. Scientists think it might be showing some early warning. faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. 
Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down. Our Sun. Scenario 1. Something strange just happened now. Every TV channel, the news, they're all talking about a black hole that came closer to us, on the spot where our sun used to be. You can even see an accretion disk, and the background of the sky looks kind of distorted, which means it got really close. Normally, black holes are so far away that we can't see them with the unaided eye. You can't even see them with a telescope directly. What's it doing here so close? And where's the sun? Did the black hole swallow it? The sun used to be in the center of our solar system, far enough not to burn us, but still close enough to give us light, warmth, and beautiful scenes when it rises in the east and goes to rest in the west. Hey, this one even rhymes. <laughs> well, it gave us life. The most massive body in our solar system contains 99.8% of its total mass. It's so wide, you could fit more than a million Earths inside of the sun. Maybe our sun turned into a black hole. But it's way too early for that to happen. I mean, that's how they form. When enormous stars come to the end of their life cycle and explode, which is called a supernova, they end up collapsing on themselves, becoming very small. It's a tiny size and a huge mass. That's what makes black holes' gravity so strong, and even light that comes too close can't escape. And all the stars in the universe are shrinking, and will disappear at some moment. Our sun loses 4 million tons of mass every second, and eventually, the only energy left in the universe will be generated by black holes. A black hole is surrounded by dust, gas, and radiation. The radiation is very dangerous, so we hope our planet won't come near it. Our solar system doesn't have light anymore. No light and no heat either. So even Mercury and Venus will probably get covered in ice pretty soon. Not to mention Earth. Do I need to say nothing will survive this new ice age? The only salvation might come from the accretion disk that spins so fast it generates heat. But that's too many chances to take. Still, at least if the black hole has the same exact mass as the sun before it, all the planets will remain in the same orbits. Earth included. But if it has a mass bigger than our sun, which is something our scientists are currently trying to figure out, then bye-bye, solar system. It was nice knowing you. Scenario 2. Oh no, what's happening? It was supposed to be a nice sunny day, but now you see darkness descending so abruptly. How come it's night, yet the clock says it's 2 p.m., and the moon looks different? The TV reports say our sun is gone, and due to some mysterious events, the moon is not orbiting the Earth anymore. It's in the center of our solar system now. We don't have much time left. Since the sun is not in the center of our solar system, we now have 8 minutes and 20 seconds to become aware of it. It may take millions of years for the sun's energy to travel from its core to the surface, but 8 minutes and 20 seconds is exactly how long it takes for sunlight to reach Earth. The light takes a journey across 93 million miles, which is the distance that separates us from the sun. We're not in the habitable zone anymore. The habitable zone is the distance from a star, in our case, the sun, at which liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. Now that the sun's gone, its light won't reach us anymore, and our planet will gradually become a frozen, lifeless rock. Who knows if we'll have enough time to come up with some technologies that would provide us with the solar energy we need to sustain life on Earth. If not, well, millions or billions of years later, scientists from some other civilizations would explore it, trying to find evidence if life ever even existed there. It would be the same as we do with Mars and other planets in our solar system. 
trying to figure out if they've always been lifeless or if there might be a sign that some organisms used to live there. Something else, also vital for our life, travels at the speed of light. Gravity. Without the sun, for roughly eight more minutes, the planets would continue circling the empty center of our solar system until the clock ticks and they finally drift somewhere into an unknown direction of outer space. Our moon doesn't have a strong enough gravity to keep us in place. It can't shine so brightly to give us warmth and support life. It's so far, we can barely see it now. Without the moon that peacefully travels close to our planet as it used to, we can see tides are getting lower incredibly fast. Oh, and it's becoming really windy. Winds are so much stronger and faster now. When things were normal, our planet sat at a 23.5 degree tilt, which is the reason we had changing weather and seasons. Now the tilt is so extreme, it's getting very cold, very fast. And our time is almost up. People are screaming, everyone's in panic. We still have maybe one minute left until we sink into eternal darkness. Scenario number three. We're not sure what exactly happened and how the life we carelessly lived yesterday came to an end. No one could predict it, but it seems that, out of nowhere, a giant neutron star took the spot where our sun used to be. It's not something we'd recognize on our own. We just noticed something was different, and the sun kinda got smaller and weirder. The rest we heard on the news, and no one knows how it happened. Maybe our sun is somewhere behind the neutron star, or the star pushed it out of our solar system and into an unknown direction. A neutron star is the densest space object we know about. It has almost twice as much mass as our sun, but it's all squeezed into a star only 10 miles, 15 kilometers, across, which is about the size of a city on Earth. A neutron star forms when a huge star runs out of fuel. It collapses in a big explosion. Its very central region, the core, collapses, which is why every electron, negatively charged particle, and proton, positively charged particle, crush together into a neutron which is either uncharged or neutrally charged. We're in a very tricky situation now, basically waiting for our end to come. This neutron star has gravity two billion times stronger than the one Earth has. This means our new sun will pull all the planets in our solar system towards itself and eventually destroy them. It's already started. For the first time that we know of, the planets are leaving their stable orbits, attracted by the powerful force of the neutron star. It's becoming chaotic pretty fast. And it won't stop there. A neutron star rotates more than 700 times every second, which is incredibly fast. Our sun rotates once every 27 days. So, after it destroys all the planets, including us, this star will continue whirling throughout the universe at about one-fifth the speed of light. Maybe it will slow down and fizzle out with time, but maybe not. After thousands of years, many neutron stars begin to slow down and blow out. But that doesn't always happen. If it meets another star, it will orbit it and start to feed off its atmosphere until it collapses at some point and turns into a giant black hole. Eh, our sun was going to burn out anyway. Until the neutron star showed up, the sun was 4.6 billion years old, which was about halfway through its lifespan. It had already burned off about half of its hydrogen stores and had enough supplies for another 5 billion years. It was eventually supposed to end up the size of the Earth. After running out of fuel, it would have simply collapsed. It would have retained its enormous mass, but its volume was going to be similar to that of our planet. No sun, no life. So the result would have been basically the same. But this way, it would have been a slow process. Who knows if humans would even inhabit this solar system in those times? But with neutron stars, things move towards the end pretty quickly, and it's way more chaotic. If the neutron star was going crazy somewhere far away in another galaxy, we'd only see it in the shape of a distant flashing light that we call a pulsar. But this way, boom! Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened, at least the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. 
The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. 
deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be above 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano. 
and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of many earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super-eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super-eruption would be ash and ashfall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super-eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super-eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. 
The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. At a distance of 640 light years from the sun, scientists discovered planet WASP 76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its sun and always turned to it in the same side. The term is tidally locked. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough so that metals condense again and fall down as rain. Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. Hmm, Figures. A recent study claims that the moon has a tail. And every month, it wraps around our planet like a scarf. A slender tail made up of millions of atoms of sodium follows Earth's natural satellite. And our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. You won't believe it, but the moon seems to be shrinking. Earth's natural satellite is now 150 feet smaller than it used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. 
The reason for this phenomenon might be the cooling of the Moon's insides. It could also explain the quakes shaking the surface of our planet's natural satellite. Astronomers have recently found out that Mars is seismically active. Mars quakes occur there on a regular basis. For several days every month, the Moon remains between the Sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks up that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But on those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the Moon's full diameter. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on such planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every nine hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests that there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry, there's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees. That's hot enough to melt some metals. As for vacations there, I'll pass. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that we could fill all our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans thousands of times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there might just be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of its star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only habitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. And get this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. 
Those in turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. The biggest explosion since the Big Bang was registered in 2019. This happened in the Ophiuchus Cluster, which unites thousands of galaxies. According to scientists, the blast was equal to 20 billion billion that's 18 zeros, megaton explosions happening once a millisecond for 240 million years. Um, I'll have to trust that. My math is not that good. In 2019, NASA's InSight lander, whose goal was to study the interior of Mars, registered the first Mars quake ever. These quakes were coming fast, about two per day. Most of them were tiny. You wouldn't even feel them if they happened on our planet. So far, more than 300 Mars quakes have been detected. Those are the first quakes on any space body other than Earth and the Moon. Another mysterious phenomenon discovered by the mission was bizarre magnetic pulses. They occurred every midnight around the lander. It's still unclear what those pulses were. Maybe after midnight, they're going to let it all hang out, or something. Pluto's atmosphere rises much higher above the surface of the dwarf planet than, let's say, Earth's. It also has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. Remember the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth? Hey, I wasn't around then, but who could forget? There might have been another space show that ended badly for at least 75% of all life on our planet in the past. Roughly 360 million years ago, a supernova explosion occurred about 65 light years away from us, and the cosmic rays sent by it swept away the ozone layer of our pretty blue ball. Wow, tough neighborhood. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So, I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. 
These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the old faithful geyser or the grand prismatic spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes, and the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. 
periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. 
The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees. But at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. 
Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Pollan, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew! There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, That's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. 
The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. 
Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. 
As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, at 8.45 p.m., about 20 miles southwest of the capital. Molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories – active, dormant, or extinct. Around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive. 
and this all happened six miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close. While other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption. And those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March, and geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top five most dangerous volcanoes in the U.S., so geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then, but this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, a tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. The eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon a dirty thunderstorm. That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. Scientists think it might be showing some early warning signs.
travels faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down. You look up and see a bright orange flash in the sky. A bit later, you hear a boom so loud, the window panes around you burst into pieces. And then you see it. A giant piece of space rock burning high above your head, heading for Earth. When it touches the surface, the explosion leaves behind an enormous crater. It's 12 miles deep and as wide as Lake Michigan. After that, three-quarters of all living organisms on our planet are on the edge of survival. This event took place about 66 million years ago. And the bright flash in the sky was the very asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. These days, people have many ways to protect themselves. Like we could hide in bunkers deep underground and survive. Such bunkers would already come in handy, since there are many asteroids in the sky. And some of them are just waiting for their ticket to Earth to wreak some havoc. For example, the asteroid 1990 MU. In 2027, it'll come alarmingly close to our planet. Many people fear that Earth's gravitational pull will trap the rock, which is the size of two Brooklyn bridges. In this case, it'll start to move closer and eventually crash into the planet's surface. Such an impact would cause a shock wave that would be felt on other continents. Once the asteroid hit the ground, there would be an explosion. It'd be so bright, people would think a new sun appeared right here on Earth. The collision would release a huge amount of energy that would then turn into heat. Everything around the impact site would catch fire. And if the asteroid fell in the water, it would cause tsunami waves higher than the Empire State Building. Many coastal cities would be flooded. The dust that would rise after the explosion would cover the sun. The world would be plunged into darkness. If the dust stayed in the air long enough, the climate on the planet would change and Earth would start to freeze. If you think such a small meteorite can't cause serious damage, look at the Chayabinsk meteor. It hit the Earth in the winter of 2013. When the space rock entered the atmosphere, people miles away heard a loud bang. The brightly burning object was approaching the surface at about 11 miles per second. Halfway through the flight, it split into several pieces. This caused several stronger shock waves. When the meteorites hit the ground, it caused a major earthquake and the aftershock from the explosions shattered the windows of 5,000 buildings. People in six cities around the crash site felt the aftereffects of the fall. And this meteorite was only 60 feet wide. Fortunately, the asteroid 1990 MU will move past our planet. We'll be safe. Whew! But the next asteroid to approach Earth is going to be 3 miles wide. It's called 3122 Florence. 
If this giant hit our planet, it could wipe entire continents off the face of the Earth. In 2017, this space rock got awfully close to us. It could be seen in the sky even with a small telescope. Now, the next asteroid is the biggest one to worry about. 1999 JM8. It's about as wide as Manhattan, and it has an unnerving habit of approaching Earth a bit too close for everyone's liking. A small asteroid named 2020 VT4 got closer to our planet than all others have ever done. In November 2020, it flew over the Pacific Ocean at an altitude a bit smaller than the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That space rock was about the size of a big car. If it did make it to Earth's atmosphere, it would burn up completely before touching the ground. Falling asteroids and meteorites aren't uncommon on our planet. Luckily, most of them burst into flames and burn up before they enter the atmosphere. Mars is to blame for such frequent meteor showers. The planet isn't far from the main asteroid belt in the solar system. Sometimes, the gravitational pull of the red planet grabs asteroids from there. Then, Mars spins them around and flings them in our direction, just like a slingshot. So, Mars is a bully. <laughs> Good thing we're protected by Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it has an incredibly strong gravitational field. It keeps the asteroid belt in line and protects us from being constantly hit by a rain of meteorites. And that's good news, considering Ceres is in the asteroid belt. This enormous space rock is so big that it was once considered to be a planet. Then, for many years, scientists called Ceres an asteroid. But in 2006, it was finally classified as a dwarf planet. This space object contains a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt, which is about 4% of the Moon's mass. If Earth were as large as a nickel, Ceres would be about the size of a poppy seed. So, what if an asteroid several miles across was heading toward our planet and people had to stop it? Well, we could break the space rock into smaller pieces. A massive explosion could be used to do this. People wouldn't even need to land on the giant asteroid getting close to its surface would be enough. Boom! A powerful burst of energy would split the asteroid into several large pieces and tons of debris. The smallest rocks would burn in the heat released in the blast, and it would also change the asteroid's trajectory. The larger fragments would burn up while entering the atmosphere. All witnesses of this unusual meteor shower would have a chance to admire a beautiful fire show. Another means of protection could be a kinetic battering ram. Simply put, it would be a huge object that people would send towards the asteroid approaching Earth. Or it could be a heavy spaceship. This is the method scientists produce to prevent the asteroid Apophis from falling to Earth. This guy is 1,200 feet across and often passes by our planet, coming as close as 19,000 miles above Earth's surface. The asteroid is going to pass close to our planet again in 2029. And there is a possibility that in 3036, it might crash into the Earth. If it happened, the explosion would leave a crater more than 3 miles across. Within 6 miles of the impact zone, all buildings and subway tunnels would be crushed or severely damaged. The event would also trigger a powerful earthquake. In the area of 30 miles away from the crater, car windows and window panes in houses would be shattered. And 75 miles away from the impact site, the earthquake would move furniture and buildings. One way to stop such a catastrophe is to build a heavy spaceship. It would take off from Earth, speed up, and then ram into the asteroid with great force. This impact would alter the course of the huge space rock, and it would fly past our planet. We could also try to stop the asteroid by wrapping it in foil. This would make its surface reflective, and then solar pressure might gradually change the asteroid's trajectory. Another alternative is using the gravitational tug. In this case, we would send an unmanned spaceship, large and heavy, toward the asteroid. It would fly over the space rock and slowly draw the thing closer with its gravitational pull. A small change, of course, would be enough to make the asteroid fly past our planet. Another way to protect Earth would be to build a system of giant lenses in space. Perhaps you've tried focusing sunlight with eyeglass lenses. Then you know how hot this sunlight can get. Now imagine having many giant lenses that are all directed at one point. 
Scientists think that focusing such a powerful beam of light on the asteroid would make the rock melt and evaporate, slowly changing its route. And one more way to protect ourselves from the asteroid would be to install several rocket engines on its surface. It would turn the space object into a rocket, and we could set its course from Earth. Rogue stars pose a much bigger danger. Like asteroids, they fly through space and can collide with anything in their path. The problem is that they have a gigantic mass, sometimes comparable to our suns. Around 70,000 years ago, a duo of rogue stars whooshed past the sun. It didn't affect Earth, but caused some disturbance on the outskirts of the solar system. This event is likely to happen again, someday. The rogue star Gliese 710, about half the mass of our sun, is moving toward our solar system right now. There's a possibility that it'll begin to grab asteroids from the outer asteroid belt and toss them at us. And then, rare meteor showers you can observe these days will become a regular occurrence. But right now, this rogue star is extremely far from our world. And there's a bigger chance that it'll pass by without affecting our peaceful existence. Asteroids flying around is sometimes like a fierce game of dodgeball, where you never know when some of them can go in your direction. So we can just track the situation and hope for the best. To figure out the risk, scientists from different organizations have to study the positions and paths of the asteroids that come close to our planet, especially those that are at least 0.6 miles wide. And the good news is that none of these asteroids will probably hit us for at least the next 1,000 years. Phew! To give us an idea of their power, scientists did an experiment to simulate the impact of such a gigantic asteroid. The energy released from the collision would be a mind-blowing 100,000 megatons. That's like detonating 15,000 tons of dynamite. Also, if such a big asteroid hit us, Earth would cool down significantly because of all that debris that would go into the atmosphere and block sunlight. Plants wouldn't be able to get their fuel in this case, so we'd all be in trouble, both humans and animals. Thankfully, such mammoth asteroid impacts are quite rare. The larger an asteroid, the longer it takes it to collide with Earth. For example, it's estimated that asteroids with diameters of at least 0.6 miles strike our planet about once every 700,000 years. And if we're talking about even bigger ones that are 3 miles wide, well those are predicted to come crashing down only once every 30 million years. Yay! But hold on, don't get too relaxed just yet. Astronomers focus on really large asteroids because those are the ones that can kinda doom our planet if they hit us. Yep, you got it right, in a dinosaur kind of way. Even if one of them didn't erase us completely, the damage would still be enormous. So, there are still some asteroids wandering around that we need to keep an eye on to see how they might evolve over time. Scientists have a model of tracking them where they focus on the parts of an asteroid's path that come close to our planet to see if the space rock poses a risk to us. And it seems there might be one asteroid, 7482, 1994 PC1, 3,600 feet in diameter that might pose some danger. It's supposed to come closer to our planet in the next 1,000 years. And when I say risky, it means there's a 0.0151% chance of it coming within one Earth-Moon distance. It already passed by us in 2022, but we were lucky because it was far enough 1.2 million miles. I'd say we can relax when it comes to asteroid scenarios. For now, asteroids slamming into Earth would be new for humankind, but not for the planet itself. As I said, there weren't many of those big ones, but they still had enormous consequences. The first one that comes to most people's minds is, of course, the dinosaur asteroid as big as a mountain that struck our home planet around 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It was chaotic. Global firestorms and tsunamis were all over the place. Dust was blocking out the sun, and vaporized rock released sulfur, which then led to acid rain and the acidification of the oceans. But there was an even bigger fella that came before that one. Around two billion years ago, a gigantic asteroid crashed into our planet and left a massive crater in South Africa. The one we know today as the Redifort Crater. And it seems this asteroid might have been even bigger than we all originally thought twice as wide as the space rock that erased dinosaurs. The Redifor crater is confirmed to be the biggest visible crater on Earth, with a diameter of about 99 miles. It used to be even bigger when it first formed, though. Maybe even 155 to 174 miles across. It's hard to figure out its true size because the crater has been eroding for the past 2 billion years. 
Think of it like slicing off layers from the rim of a bowl. The diameter gets smaller with each slice. When the asteroid, seven or five miles wide, that wiped away dinosaurs hit Earth about 66 million years ago, it caused massive destruction. Forest fires, acid rain, tsunamis, and so much ash and dust that it changed Earth's climate. This all made about 75% of life on our planet extinct. The asteroid that created the Redifort crater was not only bigger, but it also traveled at a higher speed, which means the consequences there would have been even worse. But it happened a long time ago, and living beings were different back then. Maybe it was some bacteria that didn't even notice that something unusual was happening. Earth is not the only one. Lots of impacts have happened across our solar system too. For example, in our close neighborhood. Yup, moving to Mercury and its massive crater called the Caloris Basin. It measures about 950 miles across, which is more than the state of Texas. There's a ring of towering mountains around the crater which makes it look even more impressive. You can see different colors in the mosaic image of the Caloris Basin. They tell us more about the geology of the basin. The orange parts represent lava that once flooded the basin. These lava flows covered the original surface and added this specific orange hue. And after the lava flooded the basin on Mercury, smaller craters formed on top of the lava surface. These craters dug into the ground and uncovered the material hidden beneath the lava. Some of this material is blue in color. And this blue stuff could be a clue about what the original floor of the basin had looked like before the lava covered it. Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, has a thick atmosphere that comes with a pretty good defense system against space rocks. It's so dense that it burns up most meteors before they even reach its surface. As a result, you won't see as many visible craters on Venus as on other rocky planets in our solar system. But Venus still has some scars that can tell us about some serious impacts that happened there. And one of the biggest scars we know about is Mead Crater. It's enormous, about 170 miles in diameter. The inner floor of this crater is relatively flat and kind of brighter than its surroundings. It's possible that the crater ended up filled with a mixture of melted rock after the impact, and maybe even lava from volcanic activity on Venus. Want to get an idea of what Earth might look like without its protective layer called atmosphere? Just take a look at the moon. Its surface is littered with impact craters. This Tycho is one of the craters you'll easily notice on the moon. When you look at the full moon, you can spot it as a distinct circle with bright rays that radiate outward, slightly off-center on the lower left side of the moon. This crater, 53 miles wide, has a beautiful central peak in the middle that's topped with an intriguing boulder. The size of this boulder is impressive. It would fill about half of a typical city block here on Earth. When talking about craters, we definitely can't leave out Mars. The red planet has a much thinner atmosphere than Earth. When spacecraft approach Mars, they rely on the planet's atmosphere to slow them down as they enter it. And indeed, the atmosphere helps slow spacecraft down during landing. But it's still not thick enough to completely protect Mars from all those space rocks that are coming all the time. From July to September 2018, a dark spot appeared on the southern pole of Mars. It consists of two distinct patterns. A theory says that the bigger, lighter colored blast pattern can be the result of an impact shock wave scouring the ice surface. The impact generated winds that spread out and scoured the ice. The inner blast pattern, which is darker in color, occurred because the impacting object managed to penetrate the thin ice layer. As it hit the surface, it sent dark sand and debris flying. The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. 
As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived. Or even better, the rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing. Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and Velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as Ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with Parasaurolophysis. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, 
and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kinda cute. People ride horses, camels, parasaurolophysis, and pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost as same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses, would have survived, but in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA, and it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? Uh-oh. Something is nearing the surface of the planet. It looks like a fireball hurtling closer and closer at a truly incredible speed. Soon, it becomes obvious that the collision is inevitable. BAM! The impact leaves a huge crater. It evaporates thousands of cubic miles of solid rock, and it also sets off a series of terrible natural disasters. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You believe I'm talking about the catastrophic collision that occurred around 66 million years ago on Earth. You know, the one that's responsible for the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs and three-quarters of other life forms on our planet? But no, the disaster I'm talking about happened on a different planet. Scientists think that our close neighbor, Mars, once experienced the same catastrophe that struck Earth. It happened around 3.4 billion years ago. An asteroid collision might have caused a mega tsunami on the red planet, similar to the one that caused the Chicxulub impact on Earth. Scientists have identified an impact crater on Mars that was probably left by a comet or asteroid collision with the surface of the planet. Most likely, the space body landed in an ocean in the Martian northern lowlands, and the impact was so powerful that it caused a mega tsunami. Before the latest studies, the exact location of the impact crater wasn't verified, it was just a theory. To confirm it, a team of astronomers simulated a comet and asteroid collision in the area where they supposed the impact crater was. They even named this crater Paul. Paul is 68 miles across and lies in a region that is almost 400 feet below the supposed sea level. Anyway, the simulations form several craters of the same size as Paul. 
One of the simulations claimed that these craters had been left by a 5-mile-wide asteroid that had encountered strong ground resistance. The other simulation showed that the craters had been caused by a bit smaller asteroid that met a weaker ground resistance. But according to both simulations, the impact crater was almost 70 miles in diameter, and the collisions produced mega tsunamis up to 900 miles away from the center of the impact site. The simulations also help scientists estimate the height of the tsunami. It was about 820 feet tall, almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. The authors of the study also suggest that the Pole Crater might be similar to the Chicxulub impact crater on our planet. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least 6 miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. This splashdown was so powerful that it left its signature on the entire face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega-ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. An even newer study suggests that the asteroid also triggered a tsunami so devastating it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the Indian Ocean tsunami that hit Indonesia in 2004. The collision displaced so much water that it created a wave almost a mile high. That's like two Burj Khalifas, which is the tallest construction in the world, stacked one on top of the other. And of course, all that empty space didn't stay empty for long. The ocean gushed back to fill the crater. But in the process, it only ricocheted off the crater's rim, which produced even more waves. After that, tsunami waves that were more than 33 feet tall traveled around the world at a speed of 3 feet per second, lashing at all coastlines on their way. Imagine a three-story building rushing up to you. No wonder the largest and fastest-moving waves occurred near the impact area in the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Those rose more than 330 feet tall, which is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and moved at a speed 10 times greater than more distant tsunami waves. But back to the red planet. Some experts think that not one, but two mega tsunamis could happen on Mars. They could be triggered by a pair of meteor impacts that were several millions of years apart. Between these two collisions, Mars went through a period of climate changes. As a result, liquid water on its surface turned into ice. In other words, the first asteroid impact most likely produced waves composed of liquid water. And the second tsunami was probably formed by rounded chunks of ice water. By the way, the largest asteroid to have ever crashed into Earth might not actually be the one that ended dinosaurs. A much more catastrophic collision likely happened about 3.5 billion years ago. New evidence scientists found in northwestern Australia suggests that the asteroid I'm talking about was 12 to 18 miles across. It struck Earth at an immense speed, releasing an unimaginable amount of energy. Now this made me think, what if something like that happened these days? More than 30,000 objects that are circling Earth these days could potentially crash into our planet. NASA considers around 1,500 of them to be potentially hazardous. These space rocks are the remains left after the solar system was formed some 4.6 billion years ago. For example, in 2004, astronomers discovered a huge asteroid nearing Earth. The first observation showed that the chance of the space rock hitting our planet was less than 3%. The asteroid was named Apophis. It's more than 1,200 feet across and weighs about 20 million tons. It's supposed to streak across the sky on April 13, 2029. Apophis will pass at a distance of 19,000 miles away from Earth's surface. But even though this space rock might miss our planet in 2029, it doesn't mean it won't return 15 years later in 2036. If such an object hits our planet, the consequences will be unpredictable. They can vary from shattered glass and broken windows to most life forms getting wiped off the face of the Earth. And it'll probably affect the internet. Now that last thought is truly scary. 
But luckily, modern technologies are likely to help us avoid any catastrophic consequences. Experts have developed several ways to prevent a real-life disaster movie from happening. For one thing, we could use a spacecraft to knock this visitor from outer space off its course. Or it could somehow be blasted into pieces. Scientists could also slow the thing down with the help of concentrated sunlight. Or people could tug it away with a gravity tractor. That's a theoretical spacecraft that can influence objects in space without touching them. In sci-fi movies, a huge asteroid often sneaks up on Earth and turns out to be a nasty surprise to astronomers. It hurtles toward our planet at breakneck speed and gets discovered just weeks or even days before the collision. In reality, scientists are constantly watching all large objects in Earth's neighborhood. It means there would be plenty of time to do something before the inevitable happened. There are three kinds of missions scientists could prepare at short notice. Type 0 – when a heavy spacecraft hurdles toward the intruder with one single goal – to knock it off its course. In this case, astronomers would have to rely on the already available information. The Type 1 mission would involve a scout. It would be launched first to get more close-up information about the space rock. Only after that, the main spacecraft would be launched. With more precise information, its journey would be way more productive. And if scientists chose the Type 2 mission, they would send a scout and a small spacecraft at the same time. The spacecraft would knock the asteroid a bit off its course. Then the scout would collect all the necessary information. Based on this data, the spacecraft would finish its job with a more fine-tuned second push. If none of these methods work, people could try going deep underground or even build a shelter on the ocean floor. But in this case, we'd need to find sources of energy that could help us survive for at least several decades. Plus, people would have to create a life support system that could somehow keep air and water fresh. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. 
That is how the Pingualua crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best-preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. 
The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. It's staring at you, and you're staring at it. A giant eye that seems to be pulling you into an abyss. You're hovering over it in your space copter. But however scared you might be, you still need to do your job. So you send your copter down to the surface of the red planet. Right, that's where you are, on Mars. But first things first, you take a moment to remember everything you know about the fourth planet from the Sun. It's the last of the inner planets. Those are the planets that lie within the asteroid belt. They're also called terrestrial, since they're made up of rocks and metals. The atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than Earth's. It contains 95% carbon dioxide and a mere 1% of oxygen. In other words, don't even think about pulling off your helmet. Anyway, there's no time to waste. You land on the surface of the planet and find yourself in a brownish-red world. That's a good thing you're wearing a spacesuit. This place is freezing cold. The thermometer sewn into the sleeve of your suit shows minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Time to take your first step on the Martian surface. The planet looks quite colorful, and the hue of a particular area depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The ground under your feet is covered in fine dust. It looks like rust. The same orange dust is in the air. Good thing you have your own supply of oxygen and don't need to breathe Martian air. The layer of this dust covering the surface of Mars can be from 6 to 40 feet thick. You hope you'll avoid getting swallowed by some Martian quicksand. You start walking, feeling very light. Mars is just 15% of our planet's volume and a mere 11% of Earth's mass. It means that gravity here is much weaker. Its pull is 38% as strong as the pull of gravity on the surface of Earth. You jump up and down and then try to run several hundred feet. Ha! You haven't even broken a sweat. What makes it harder for you to explore the place on foot is that the planet's surface is rocky, covered with craters and horizon, but you try to suppress your curiosity. You'll have enough time to figure out what it is later. Suddenly, a massive cloud appears in the distance. It looks as if a huge herd of horses is approaching you. In reality, you better get back into your copter and fly away as fast as you can. That's one of Mars's infamous dust storms. They mostly occur during the summer in the southern hemisphere of the red planet. They can sometimes cover the entire planet. And you see the largest ones from Earth. You hop into your copter and set a course for the eye that scared you so much. Winding channels that look like veins run through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less it looks like an actual eye. Soon you realize it's a crater. It's giant, almost 19 miles across. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, there was Martian water in the enormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Now, remember that towering something on the horizon? It's time to go and explore it. When you come close, you realize it's the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which is almost the same size as the state of Arizona. You tilt your head. Wow! The mountain is 16 miles high. It's also rimmed by 4-mile-high cliffs. To picture the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, towering around 2.5 miles above sea level and stretching 75 miles across. Sounds impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. But why is this volcano so large? It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason might be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. It's static. 
You see, on our planet, the crust is made of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hot spots producing lava, new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth. And the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. So, how about getting closer to the enormous mountain? But once you step out of your copter on Martian soil, the ground under your feet starts shaking. Well, that's a Mars quake. But how can it happen if Mars doesn't have any actively shifting tectonic plates? Specialists from NASA are sure Mars quakes occur when energy inside the planet gets suddenly released. It leads to rock fractures and cracks in the planet's crust. Another powerful jolt, and one of such cracks opens right next to you. You fall to the ground, afraid to move. But soon, everything calms down. You wait for a couple of minutes, just to be sure, and get up. Oh look! Here's a perfect opportunity to explore the insides of the red planet. The crack is large enough to send a special research robot. The planet's crust is thin and consists of volcanic basalt rock. The mantle that surrounds the core of the planet is made up of thick silicates, oxygen, and some minerals. You can probably compare it with soft, rocky toothpaste. Mars's mantle is also much thinner than Earth's. It's just 800 to 1100 miles thick. As for the planet's core, it's made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur and is between 900 and 1200 miles wide. This core doesn't move. That's why Mars doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field. Unfortunately, your drone is now lost in the depths of the red planet. You leave it there and continue your exploration. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. It sounds more like an Italian red sauce, but it's actually an enormous canyon, or rather a canyon system, that runs along Mars's equator. It's as awe-inspiring as Olympus Mons, more than 2,600 miles long and over 4 miles deep. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Now let's make another comparison. One of the most famous canyons on Earth is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But it's 10 times shorter and around 4 times less deep than this canyon on Mars. Some scientists think that Valles Marineris is the edge of an enormous tectonic plate. It moves so slowly that almost nothing has happened in that region over millions of years. And the movement of this plate probably began 3.5 billion years ago. Anyway, the only thing left on your today's to-do list is to visit Mars's moons. They're among the tiniest in the solar system. Phobos is the largest of the two. It orbits a mere 3,700 miles above the surface of Mars. There's no other known moon that travels closer to its mother planet. It whips around the red planet three times a day, while the second moon, Deimos, needs 30 hours to complete one orbit. Phobos is getting closer and closer to Mars, about 6 feet each 100 years. Within the next 50 million years, it'll either crash into the planet or break apart and form a ring. Happy but tired, you return to your spaceship. Tomorrow, you'll continue exploring the magnificent red planet. And who knows what discoveries are awaiting you. Hold on to your space helmets because NASA's Curiosity rover has just stumbled upon the wildest rock formation ever. And on April Fool's Day, isn't that just the weirdest coincidence? The device captured some images with some rocks that look like dragon bones. Now, let me take you back to 2012 when Curiosity made its grand entrance on Martian soil. It was like the queen bee of rovers, the biggest and most capable one at the time. And boy, has it been making waves since then. It's even discovered evidence of water and organic molecules on Mars. These findings were giant leaps in our quest to find out if Mars ever had its own little creatures. But hey, let's not forget that Curiosity is no spring chicken anymore. It's been trotting around Mars for a solid 11 years, and its heyday may have come and gone with the launch of the shiny new Perseverance rover. Nevertheless, Curiosity still manages to capture our imagination with its knack for spotting familiar-looking rocks. From objects shaped like fish backbones to ones that resemble traffic lights, Curiosity has given us plenty to marvel at. But now the internet is exploding with excitement over the jaw-dropping images from Curiosity's masked camera. People are going bonkers over what can only be described as dragon bones. 
One astrobiologist acknowledged we've seen our fair share of weird-looking objects on Mars. But this one exceeded all expectations. The current theory is that these unique ripples on the structure were formed after a whole lot of erosion, probably caused by the Martian winds. Now, you might be thinking, okay, cool, but what's the big deal about a funky rock? Well, for starters, it's a reminder of just how much we still have to uncover about our mysterious red neighbor. While we're gazing over potential dragon bones and daydreaming about interplanetary adventures, Curiosity has its serious hat on. Its main mission is to gather as much data as possible and figure out if Mars was ever a cozy home for teeny tiny microbial life forms. It isn't the first time our trusty Curiosity rover has stumbled upon something truly out of this world. Our robotic explorer buddy has also given us a peek at a teeny tiny rock on the red planet. It bears an uncanny resemblance to a fossilized book. Can you imagine stumbling upon a Martian library? On the 3,800th Martian day of its mission, our adventurous rover captured an intriguing snapshot of this unusual discovery. Using its nifty Mars hand lens imager attached to its robotic arm, Curiosity snapped a pic of this rock that looks like it's been plucked straight from a librarian's wildest dreams. Before you get too carried away with fantasies of outer space reading materials, let's clarify the dimensions of this rock. While it may resemble a book, it's pint-sized in comparison. In fact, it's only a mere one inch across. So don't go expecting the next Martian bestseller to hit the shelves anytime soon. It's more of a pocket-sized edition, perfect for a quick read during interplanetary commutes. Now before you get too excited about this discovery, do know that NASA officials commented the peculiarly shaped rocks are pretty common on Mars. Also, billions of years of relentless Martian winds have swept away everything except these uniquely shaped remnants. Curiosity has quite the eye for spotting unusual formations. Back in February 2022, our rover pal stumbled upon a mineral flower with branching patterns that looked like it had been styled by a florist. It measured a petite 0.4 inch in width. And just a few weeks later, on February 16th, Curiosity managed to capture some rocky evidence of ancient lakes featuring teeny ripples and waves frozen in time. If you thought Mars was just a desolate red wasteland, think again. Scientists have even discovered larger scale shapes etched into the Martian surface by ancient water. For instance, there's a rock formation that bears an uncanny resemblance to the adorable face of a teddy bear. Who knew Mars had a cuddly side? And to top it off, there's another rock that looks like the spitting image of the frizzy-haired cartoon character. But curiosity isn't just about oddities and peculiarities. Remember that time on February 2nd when the rover unveiled the first clear images of sun rays on Mars? Picture this, as the sun dips below the Martian horizon during sunrises or sunsets, its rays create a mesmerizing sight as they pierce through gaps in the clouds. It's like Mother Nature's own laser light show. There are even images online with a so-called doorway on Mars. And no, it's not a secret passage for little green Martians to hop in and out of, if that's what you're thinking. The internet went bonkers when Curiosity captured a snapshot that seemed to reveal an object resembling a door. Cue the weird theories and intergalactic excitement, nothing to worry about, as experts have chimed in with a down-to-earth explanation. According to specialists who know a thing or two about Mars geology, this particular structure is most likely the result of natural erosion. Boring answer, I know, but erosion is yet again to blame here. However, some scientists have also chimed in with a dash of humor on the matter. They pointed out that the door stands at a modest height of less than three feet. So even if we were to believe it's a doorway for Martians, we'd have to imagine a particular type of tiny extraterrestrial beings like Martian hobbits. But let's get back to reality, shall we? The consensus among experts is that this door is nothing more than a shallow opening in the rock, cleverly crafted by the forces of nature. Those visible layers were likely deposited around 4 billion years ago under sedimentary conditions, potentially in a river or a wind-blown dune. The winds on Mars have been hard at work, eroding these layers over time, leaving behind the intriguing features we see today. And if you look closely, you'll notice a few natural vertical fractures scattered throughout the image. These fractures are a result of rocks weathering on Mars, and the small cave-like structure we've affectionately nicknamed the door seems to have formed at the intersection of these fractures and the aforementioned layers. It's almost as if a gigantic Martian boulder decided to take a tumble, creating this whimsical cave entrance. 
There's also a famous Mars crater that's not just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill hole in the ground. It's chock full of shiny opal gemstones. According to a cool new study, those mysterious halos of rock surrounding cracks in the Martian crater might actually be made up of water-rich opal gemstones. Can you imagine that? Mars, the planet of bling. Curiosity yet again came to the rescue and did some serious snooping around. It seems there's an ancient dried up lake bed on Mars that is teeming with opal gemstones. These objects could be evidence that water and rock have been having a grand old time beneath the Martian surface. Much more recently than anyone had previously thought, that is. Now, when scientists start talking about water, you know they're on the hunt for signs of life. After all, water is pretty crucial for life as we know it. But here's the catch. Water isn't flowing on Mars anymore. So these clever scientists have to put on their detective hats and search for geological signs that water once existed there. What does opal have to do with water on the Martian surface? Well, to make opal, you need rocks with a whole lot of silica and some good old H2O. There's more. Researchers also dove deep into the Curiosity rover's image archive and discovered that these opal-rich halos are not just hanging out in one spot. Nope. They seem to be spread out all over the place in Gale Crater, which is like a huge ancient lake bed. So what did these clever scientists do next? They ran some tests, of course. Using Curiosity's fancy instruments, they confirmed that these light-colored halos do, in fact, contain opal. All this data and those cool fracture halo pictures from earlier in the mission led the researchers to a mind-boggling conclusion. Water must have been hanging out all over Gale Crater for a long time after the ancient lake dried up. This means that life might have existed on Mars and for a bit longer than we'd been guessing. Who knows, maybe even into Mars's modern geological period, which get this started a whopping 2.9 billion years ago. So imagine being one of the first people sent to explore Mars. As you're approaching the red planet, something strange and creepy draws your attention. There, yes, right there. Doesn't it look like a mammoth bear's head? What or who could possibly create a bear snout in the middle of a crater? Unfortunately, or should I say luckily, there's nothing mysterious about the bear's head. It's just a facial pareidolia. That's a tendency to see facial features in everyday things. Hmm, but speaking about the finding on Mars, should we rename the phenomenon into Beridolia? You could see that coming, couldn't you? Alright, check it out. You see a V-shaped hill that looks like a nose. Then there are two craters that look like eyes. And then there's a circular fracture pattern, the head, that surrounds the nose and the eyes. Experts think that the face could be created when a deposit was settling over a buried impact crater. And the nose might be a mud or volcanic vent with solidified lava or mud flows around it. Anyway, the crater does look like a bear's face, I'll give you that. But thanks to HiRISE, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, another of NASA's amazing acronyms, we've seen many other crazy craters on the red planet. Like smiley faces, a bird, or an elephant. First, let's have a look at the famous face of Mars. These images were first taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. At that time, the resolution was obviously quite poor, plus the lighting was slanted, which produced the result that shocked people in the 1970s – a face carved of rock staring back at Earth. Did it mean there was another civilization on Mars that had created this monument? Nah. Look at the photo of the same spot taken by the current Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The resolution is much, much better, and the face has miraculously turned into an ordinary hill. Or look at this teeny Bigfoot, whose image was captured in 2008. I say teeny because this creature is just a few inches tall. And when the photo was taken, Bigfoot was only several yards away from the camera. And here, one curious soul zoomed in on a small rock and spotted something that resembled a gorilla. That's how some people started to believe there were apes on Mars. Yeah, really. Let me show you some more examples of imaginary creatures and faces on the red planet. Most of them come from a series of images taken by the Themis camera. Currently, it's on board the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which only needs two hours to orbit the red planet, carrying some important scientific instruments. Let me introduce my happy Martian to you. This two-mile-wide crater was photographed in 2008. The next crater chain looks like a wasp with its wispy wings of impact debris. 
The whole feature was probably created by a meteorite that fell at a very low angle and broke into pieces right before the impact. Now, do you see a woolly mammoth or an elephant here? Lava flows in one region on Mars left this image on its reddish soil. The region itself, called Elysium Planitia, is famous for the planet's youngest lava flows. For example, the one that looks like a mammoth most likely formed in the past 100 million years. Eh, just yesterday. Now let's talk about love, or rather its symbol, the heart. Do you like these two hearts on the surface of the red planet? This one is actually a mesa top outlined by frost. And this heart shape is an impact crater. The hit tore away dark surface material and exposed lighter soil underneath. Then some of the material probably flew downslope, creating the heart. And this dust-covered hummingbird, can you see its long beak and head? Scientists aren't sure how this shape was formed, but they think erosion and wind played a part in its creation. These dark sand dune deposits look like a howling wolf. And here, can you see a series of interlocking gears? This image looks like the letter T, right? The right angle fracture was created by the tectonic stretching of the Martian crust. Do you think we might find other letters of the alphabet on Mars, too? Why not? And now, how about another bizarre thing astronomers noticed on the surface of Mars? Is that a door to someone's house? It was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. It became viral because this formation over here, see, looks like a door. Unfortunately, scientists, due to their rational minds, were quick to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There were several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, the opening is tiny, a mere 3 feet high. They're sure that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. If you look at the rock closely, you may notice strata. Those are layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And look at this! See those cracks? That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight. And this created the door-shaped opening. This theory is quite plausible. Because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago. But it's not only the red planet that can boast of having unusual formations. Let's take this comet, for example. This image was taken by the European spacecraft Rosetta in 2014. Can you see a face on its right-hand side? Or the moon? Here's its famous rabbit. It sits upside down, with its ears pointing downward. Some people see a man on the moon. It can either be his face or the entire body. If someone sees the whole human figure, it usually looks like it's carrying sticks. Sometimes it's a toad. To spot it, look at the top left-hand side of our moon. The toad is facing upward, see? Now look at this spinning neutron star. Such a star is a collapsed core of a supergiant star with a total mass of 10 to 25 solar masses. Except for black holes and some hypothetical objects, like quark stars or white holes, neutron stars are the densest and smallest known stellar objects. Anyway, back to this particular star. As you can see, this space object, located 17,000 light years away from Earth, is surrounded by a cloud of energetic particles. And this image, taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, appeared in 2009 and became viral in no time. All because many people spotted a hand-like structure among all that space stuff. NASA explained that the star was spinning incredibly fast, spewing energy into the space surrounding it. This created intriguing and complex structures, like the large cosmic hand so many people see. Now, look at the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation Orion. This is a freezing cold and dark cloud of dust and gas that was first noted in 1888. This dark shadowing is created by dust. And at the base of the nebula, there are many bright spots. Those are young stars at the stage of formation. 
Pay attention to this extremely bright star in the top left side of the horse head. Its radiation is so powerful that the star is starting to erode the cloud around itself. It means that, in millions of years, the nebula might not resemble the head of a horse anymore. Well, I won't be around then. The European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope has captured an image in which we can see the collision of three different galaxies. We can even observe the effect they have on each other. But the coolest thing is that, while colliding, they created a recognizable shape. Because doesn't it look like a giant space hummingbird? It seems like NASA and China are each planning to send humans to Mars. Both space agencies have tentative plans to launch the first crewed missions by 2033. Right when Mars and Earth are playing a game of tag. And that's not all. Other missions may happen in 2035, 2037, and beyond. The ultimate goal is to build a Mars habitat for future exploration and research. So how are they going to do that? Well, let's find out. Now, traveling to Mars isn't as easy as hopping on a rocket. The distance between our planets can change a lot over time, ranging from around 35 million miles to 250 million miles. And even with our best technology, it takes 6 to 9 months just to get to the red planet. So, a round trip to Mars could mean spending 3 years away from Earth, dealing with extra radiation, and floating around in microgravity. But NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has some exciting news. Scientists have been working tirelessly to design a minimal architecture mission to Mars. They're thinking that 2033 is the perfect year to make it happen. So here's the deal. Every 15 years, the rocky planets – Venus, Mars, and Earth – align just right to create a cosmic sweet spot. The mission will make the most of this rare alignment and perform an epic gravity assist maneuver using Venus. It's like getting a boost from a planetary slingshot. We'll speed up our spacecraft and reduce the need for making our own propulsion. The report also talked about some really cool ideas, like using nuclear power for spacecraft engines and using Martian resources to make things. These technologies could make space travel faster, protect astronauts from radiation, and make it easier to live in space. They might even let us make resources and fuel right on Mars. So this is how the plan goes down. First, we'll launch a spacecraft towards Mars. It'll spend around 30 days in high orbit, exploring and gathering valuable data. Then it's going to head back to Earth, also swinging by Venus for a quick visit. So this whole adventure will last approximately 570 days, which is just 1.6 years. And a shorter adventure means less exposure to radiation. Now keep in mind, this mission will focus on orbiting Mars rather than landing on its surface. It's just a stepping stone, paving the way for future landing missions. Just like Apollo 8 mission orbited the Moon before Apollo 11's historic landing. Landing on Mars by 2033 might be a bit too ambitious due to funding constraints, but who knows? If all goes smoothly, it could become a reality. Now for the coolest part. We don't need fancy new technologies or vehicles for all this. We'll make use of existing ones that are already in production or being studied for the Artemis Moon program. Now let's break down our Mars mission vehicle, a big puzzle of many parts. And guess what? It was put together by a community of space enthusiasts back in 2017. That's right, it wasn't the scientists who produced it first. But now, this isn't just some fantastic idea anymore. Most of these things are already becoming a reality, being made or planned by NASA. So let's take a look at this concept. First, we have the Orion spacecraft. This is the spaceship that will take the crew to the orbit around Earth and bring them safely back home. It's like a super fancy space taxi, and it might be the most powerful taxi to ever exist. It's combined with three powerful propulsion stages. And we're also using a special fuel that doesn't need to be ultra-cold like in the movies. Next, there's the Earth Departure Stage. 
This is an important part of the mission. It helps us make a powerful thrust that sends us on our way to Mars. Then we have Mars Transit Habitat. This is where the crew will live and hang out during their journey to Mars. Like a cozy space house with all the things they need to be comfortable. And finally, the Mars Orbit Insertion Stage. When we reach Mars, this awesome thing will help us slow down and enter its orbit smoothly. It's our maneuvering expert. Even the Mars transit habitat is being developed and might even be tested in a few years. That means we're on track to have the whole thing ready for our amazing Mars mission by 2033. In other words, it's all about working with what we've got and making it happen. Now, let's talk about the plan's timeline. Mid-2028, the action begins. First, we'll need to do a couple of test flights. We'll send two stages ahead of time to make sure we can come back to Earth safely. These stages will join together like two spaceships becoming best buddies. They'll orbit the red planet and then come home. To do all that, we'll use powerful rockets and 13 commercial launches. It's going to be a huge space party. Late 2032. After all that, we launched the fully assembled Mars mission vehicle to high Earth orbit. So far, this is an empty vehicle that awaits astronauts. If all is good, then it'll be ready for the final check. March 2033. Time for our brave crew and their Orion spacecraft to join the party. We launch them and they dock with the Mars mission vehicle in Earth's orbit. They'll make sure the whole lot is just right before we head to Mars. Flexibility is important, so we can adjust our plans if needed. April 2033. Everyone's ready for the adventure. We perform a powerful burn, like a big push that sends us on our way to Mars. The crew will travel for about 200 days. November 2033. Finally, the crew reaches the red planet. Once they're in Mars orbit, they'll spend about 30 days exploring and doing awesome space stuff. Mars will be our playground. When it's time to return home, they'll say goodbye to the stage that helped them get into Mars orbit. Then their vehicle will meet up with the two stages we sent ahead. Remember these space buddies? And after that, it will take us about 340 days for the crew to come back to Earth. This is where we'll use the gravity of Venus to slingshot around the Sun. To keep the equipment and crew at the right temperature, we'll have a sunshade that will protect us from the Sun's heat since we'll be really close to it. In the end, Orion will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the water. What a heroic ending! And this would be just the beginning! Our awesome team has another plan for the bravest adventurers out there. It's called the Conjunction Class Long Stay Mission. It launches in April 2033 and lasts a long time 950 days. That's more than two and a half years, with 550 days spent in Mars orbit. It requires fewer launches from Earth, but has some different challenges, like spending more time in microgravity and dealing with increased radiation. So we'll need some real space heroes for this one. But of course, there are some major hurdles to overcome before we can make all this happen. Experts closely looked at NASA's Journey to Mars program and found that the plan needs some serious changes. There are a few high-risk areas, like life support systems for long missions, using solar power for propulsion, making oxygen on Mars, and so on. They're also worried about timelines, funding, and many other things. So, according to them, sticking to a deadline of 2033 might be impossible with the current plans and budgets. Even aiming for 2035 carries significant risks and possible delays. But hey, space exploration has never been easy, right? With realistic determination, anything is possible. Most likely, the idea of sending people to Mars will be realized before 2040. NASA is working on finishing the plan and details to make this possible. So, even though we still have some tough nuts to crack before we can make it a reality, the dream of sending humans to Mars is exciting. <laughs>